Good evening. I want to welcome you to the new school and to the Center for Public Scholarship's keynote uh, address in, on invisibility, the power of an idea. My name is Will Milberg. I'm the dean of the New School for Social Research, which is uh, the Graduate School of Social Sciences, Philosophy, and History at the New School with a long tradition uh, dating back originally to the university in exile, and which is the home really to the Center for Public Scholarship. I was thinking that we you know, we sit just north of a big university with stern business schools and Abu Dhabi campuses. We sit south of a university with big low libraries and Columbia Law Schools, and sometimes we feel invisible. <laughs> and then we have nights like tonight. Then we have conferences like today. And we have unbelievably prestigious scholars from around the world. We have a unique collection of disciplines represented. We have provocative topics. And we have really a great and unique audience. And in, in many ways, the new school and the new school for social research, I always say, is, is quite visible in some ways, the center of the universe. What we pride very much and what this conference brings out is, is kind of this remarkable interdisciplinarity that we see, this crossing of lines, which uh, Ari and Max uh, CPS conferences often do and the journal often does. Last night I was at a conference on climate change, which had a, a geophysicist and a policymaker on the same panel talking very comfortably to each other about climate change and climate change policy. And today we saw this incredibly rich kind of conceptual uh, conference regarding the question of invisibility, the power of an idea, which brought biologists, physicists, mathematician, humanities, people from a variety of corners of the humanities, thankfully an economist, and uh, I think we, you know, tonight is a great event and, and it's been a really wonderful day from the panel I was on, the, from what I heard of the morning's panel, and I'm really pleased we can continue tonight with the keynote. I'd like to introduce the, the, the director of the Center for Public Scholarship, who will introduce our keynote speaker, and of course the organizer of the conference, Arian Mack, who is the Alfred and Monette Marrow Professor of Psychology at the New School for Social Research. She's the editor of the journal Social Research. She's the director of the Center for Public Scholarship. The, the Center for Public Scholarship not only does wonderful conferences like this, but it also is the space which produces the Endangered Scholars Worldwide uh, website full of very up-to-date information on what's going, around, uh, going on around the world in terms of uh, scholars at peril, and it's something which connects us immediately to our roots, and this kind of conference connects us to our future. So I'm very pleased, and please give a big round of applause for Arian Mack. Screw up the PowerPoint because we did that already once today, so I don't want to do it again. Anyway, uh, it's just it's blinding. Um, is there any way you can kill that light? <laughs> Thank you. That's better. Uh, so it's before I introduce these extraordinary people tonight who you're all here to listen to, I, I, I've been reprimanded for what I haven't done yet, which is to tell you that, first of all, the winter issue of social research, which is the journal of the New School for Social Research, which I edit, uh, is on invisibility. And uh, not all, but some of the speakers in this conference have articles in it, and we it is uh, 
can be purchased out in the lobby, and we urge you uh, to do that and even to uh, subscribe to the journal. Uh, it, it has been around since 1933 and started by the original university in exile uh, uni uh, group that came to the new school, rescued by the first president. And uh, this was the, supposedly the public voice of the, that then university in ex exile, which became the graduate faculty and now is the new school for social research. The, this conference series is in the uh, tradition of uh, that uh, the journal and the need for scholars to have public voices and to address social issues that are compelling and current. And uh, so we try to do that as best we can. And so now it is going to be my pleasure to introduce the speakers who I'm going to ask to come sit down because <laughs> they're lurking. They're lurking in the wings. <laughs> okay. So first, let me introduce Brian Green, who probably to many of you doesn't need too much introduction. He is director of Columbia University Center for Theoretical Physics and renowned for many reasons. Perhaps first and foremost, he is renowned for his groundbreaking discoveries in superstring theory including the co-discovery, and I, I couldn't tell you what this is, but I'll say it, of mirror symmetry and spatial topology change. He is known to the public through his books, The Elegant Universe, The Fabric of the Cosmos, and The Hidden Reality, which have collectively spent 65 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and sold more than two million copies worldwide. The Washington Post called him the single best explainer of abstruse concepts in the world today. Professor Green hosted two Peabody and Emmy award-winning Nova miniseries based on his books and is a frequent television guest joining Stephen Colbert seven times and playing himself in an episode of The Big Bang Theory. He has also had cameo roles in some Hollywood films. So we are very, very lucky to have him. I, I'm privileged. I feel really privileged that he agreed to do this, as I feel privileged that uh, Marina Warner, Dame Marina Warner, with many initials after her name. I'm going to read them. Not that I know what they all are, but I'm going to read them. DBE, FRSL, FBA. <laughs> She's a British novelist, short story writer, historian, and mythographer, and an all around extraordinary intellectual. She's professor of English and creative writing at Burbank College and a profess professorial research fellow at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Her many books, of which they are indeed many, many, include Alone of Her Sex, of All Her Sex, The Myth and the Cult of the Virgin Mary, Joan of Arc, The Image of Female Heroism, and Monuments and Maidens, The Allegory of the Female Form. In 1994, she gave the BBC Rife Lectures on the theme of six myths of our time. She explored the fairy tale tradition in From the Beast to the Blonde and Making Monsters on Scaring, Lulling, and Making Mock. Her study of the Thousand and One Nights, Stranger Magic, Charm States in the Arabian Nights won a National Book Critics Award, the Truman Capote Prize, and uh, the Zayed Prize in 2012. She's curated exhibitions, including The Inner Eye, The Metamorph Metamorphing, and Only Make Believe Ways of Playing. Her third novel, The Lost Father, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 1988. It was followed by Indigo, a retelling of The Tempest, and in 2000 by the Leto Bundle, a novel about refugees traveling in time, and is now working on a memoir, as I understand it, a memoir novel uh, about her childhood in Cairo. Anyway, it is, we're very honored to have them both, and I uh, ask you to welcome them. Thank you.
Audible. We'll hear more about that. <laughs> um, thank you, Arian, very much for a generous introduction. And thank you all for coming. And um, I've heard a great deal about invisibility from many different aspects. But I first heard about string theory in a performance lecture uh, by Brown um, in, at Columbia many years ago. Um, and I agree absolutely with something Arian said, which is there is a fabulous clarity to the way you talk about your research and your discoveries and also a sense of involving us in this clarity, which I fear may be deceptive. I don't think I quite understand as much as you made me feel I understand. <laughs> but, um, but then I also um, have encountered your work as a storyteller. And in a sense, that's part of the ground of our sympathy, as I hope will show. Um, because Al and Al, who are a couple of artists, filmmakers, very remarkable, created a film, and a film based on Brown's story, Icarus at the Edge of Time. And we will come to that later. But I heard Brown actually perform this in the Royal Festival Hall in London, in which you read your story as, as an actor, really, so as a real, as a real storyteller. Um, so my first question to you um, tonight, and we're going to try and have a conversation um, with, with accompanying images, um, is that invisibility comes in different degrees to different people. So some people see more than other people. When you look into this empty void, can you tell us what you're seeing or what we might see if we were able to see with the eyes that you have been training on these mysteries? You mean the space, the yes. space right here in the center of the universe? <laughs> um, you know, uh, emptiness, nothingness, which perhaps is the epitome of that which is invisible. If there's nothing there, then there's nothing to be seen. There's nothing to be visible. The, the whole concept of nothing is one that has gone through radical transformation over the course of decades and centuries in physics. There was a time when people could think of nothing in the colloquial sense. There's just nothing there. But as we progressed into understanding relativity and quantum physics, we learned that even empty space has something. It can warp and curve according to Einstein, which is what communicates the force of gravity from place to place. So even emptiness can have a shape. You wouldn't think that nothingness could have a shape, but it can. And then when quantum physics comes along, it says that even in the emptiest region of empty space, there's always a certain amount of activity taking place because of an observation by a fellow named Werner Heisenberg in 1927, so-called uncertainty principle, which showed that you can't ever truly have nothing because that would be a complete certain description of what was inhabiting that region of space. And the quantum uncertainty principle says there's always a degree of fluctuation, a degree of fulmination, a degree of activity that unavoidably takes place even in what you would have previously considered empty space. So as a physicist looks out into an empty region, there's a lot there. But how has that changed since when you first started? I mean, this particular, this is a kind of fabric and the hidden, the hidden universe that you've yeah. talking about. I mean, how has that changed in the you know, decades since you started? Well, since I've started, I wouldn't say that it has changed in a demonstrable way. The things that we have been working on, say, in string theory in the last decade or two are still uncertain. We don't know if they're right or not, and that's an interesting subject that perhaps gives another flavor to invisibility, sort of the distinction between what might be a description of that which is invisible, which we hope string theory is, describing the fundamental particles and the fundamental forces, things that you can't see with your eyes, versus things that are just plain wrong. And we don't know which is the right description of some of the ideas at the cutting edge. So if they're wrong, they're not describing invisibility, they're not describing nothing in any physics sense, they're, they're just nonsense that we've been confused about for decades, and that's a, a real possibility. 
But the demonstrable things that have changed in the last, say, 40 years, if we go a little bit further back, perhaps the biggest one is something called the Higgs field. Mm. Right? This is a, a proposal that comes from Peter Higgs and, and others back in the 1960s trying to answer a very basic question, which is, where does mass come from? You know, you push on anything at all, and it, it resists your push, and we call that resistance mass. The bigger the mass, the bigger the resistance. But the question is, where does the resistance to that kind of motion, when it comes to elementary constituents of matter, quarks and electrons, where does it come from? And the proposal that Peter Higgs gave is he says, look, it may be that space, even empty space, is actually filled with something called a field. Now we call it the Higgs field after him. He didn't call it that. So there's this field, this sort of invisible molasses that fills all of space. And as a particle tries to move through the molasses, it experiences a resistance drag. And that resistance drag is what we would experience as the heft of that particle. So he's proposing that all of the universe is infiltrated by this field that kind of fills every nook and cranny like steam fills a, a Turkish steam bath. And the question is, is that true? And uh, at first, when he put forward this idea, people were like, no, that, come on, it's nonsense. Yes. You know, he wrote a paper, it was rejected by the journal that he submitted it to. Yes. But then he goes around the world and gives lectures. People begin to say, hey, this is an interesting idea. He convinces enough people that it might be of interest to build a machine, a $10 billion yes, machine, yes. to try to access this invisible something that he claims is actually there. Yes. The idea being slam protons together at very high speed, shake the nothingness, shake this field, and cause a little speck of it to flick off. Yes. It would be a particle called the Higgs particle. And in 2012, we found that particle. And what has happened since? Well, we continue to examine with ever greater precision the particles produced by these collisions. And it's curious that the story is quite vanilla at the, morning, at the moment. It really is all the data is fitting into the most straightforward description that we've had on the table for, for decades. Now, in a way, you could say, that's so exciting, right? The ideas that were put down mathematically are being confirmed, and it just shows that we know what we're talking about. But a physicist lives for the things that don't work. You know, that we live for the things where there are anomalies and new things to, to try to figure out. I mean, imagine going to Congress. Well, maybe that's a bad thing to think about at all. I don't mean to terrorize anybody. But imagine going back to a funding agency and saying, we found everything that we expected. We didn't find anything weird or anomalous, but we would like more funding to build the next machine to try to perhaps push the boundary of understanding further. That's a hard argument to make. Whereas if we had some strange things happening and we Those need the new machine because we need to figure it out, that's a, at least on the face of it, a stronger argument to make. But there are still huge, deep mysteries, aren't there? I, mean, I agree with you, yeah, I mean but try convincing Republic, you know, try convincing, <laughs> try convincing people of, of this possibility when your mathematical theories are just being borne out completely. There are no anomalies. There's nothing wrong. Now, it's not to say there aren't theoretical mysteries that we can make a whole long laundry list of them, but it's less compelling than to be able to say, hey, we did this experiment. We, we can't figure out what's going on. It's weird. It's exciting. There's something new happening there. We need further investigation. That's the kind of argument that we'd prefer to make. That's the situation we, in many ways, would prefer to be in. Do you want to show some of your material, visual material? Uh, you know, uh, we can, yeah, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, you go know, ahead. Uh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I, I have really no need to, but I'm more than happy but to, they to need acquiesce. It. They need it. Um, you might yeah, say. so I just threw together a, a couple things uh, which you know, illustrate the progression of ideas that go all the way back to long before the Higgs was proposed in the 1960s, but back to the late 1600s, because even then, the issue of invisibility, sort of the, the subject of, of this gathering, that was something that drove even people like Isaac Newton yeah. a little bit okay. nutty, yeah. right? Because, yeah, if you want to bring the lights down, I'll just show a, a few things here. Maybe I should get out of the way. Yeah, so, you know, here's the, the prototypical issue that, that Newton was trying to figure out, 
there's the sun, right? There's the earth. There's empty space between them, but somehow there's this invisible force that's keeping the planets in orbit. And the amazing thing was, you can bring the lights back up. So, so Newton took that situation and you know, he did a remarkable job of explaining the data with a formula that we all know, right? We all learned it in high school. F equals G M1 M2 over R squared. You know, not to bring back the terror of mathematics, but this little, this little equation that he wrote down in the 1600s can explain what's happening there. But even he realized that that explanation was far from complete because he had no understanding of how gravity could do what we're seeing there. How can you have the sun here and the earth here in emptiness? What is filling the emptiness? What's the invisible mechanism by which gravity exerts its force? When I drop this, you don't see anything pulling on it. That's a huge mystery. Mm -hmm. What is causing it to fall? And that's what led to the next development, which is, you know, as many of you no doubt know, if you bring the lights down, Einstein comes along and he fills the emptiness, he fills the invisibility with a new picture. He says that space is flat if there's nothing there, but he says the shape of space and even time can change. If the sun is present or if the earth is present, matter warps the environment. And then he argues convincingly, mathematically, that say the moon would be kept in orbit, not by some invisible force that pulls on it, but because it's rolling along this curved shape. It's rolling along a valley in the curved environment that the Earth creates. And he shows that the Earth is kept in orbit for exactly the same reason. It's rolling along the curved shape that the sun creates. And bring the lights back up. So it's this beautiful progression over the course of 300 years where the notion of nothing, the notion of empty space is filled conceptually with startling new ideas. Mm -hmm. And those startling ideas have an observable consequence, right? Einstein now says, when I drop this, what's going on is the object is sliding along an indentation in the fabric of space that the Earth is creating. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what this invisible force of gravity actually is. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the early speculations about the nature of the divine, which of course was, was um, connected to ideas of creation, where do we come from, and so forth, attributed properties to God, and this is true of you know, many religions, one of which was invisibility. I mean, that, and, and there was ubiquity, the God, God or gods would not be subject to gravity. Most gods can fly, so as indeed angels can fly, so can de devils. I mean, the laws of natural, the natural world, the physical world that we know in our limited way at the moment um, don't apply in our imagination of divinity. But one of the things that struck me thinking about invisibility, and you have music on your, on your films, is that inaudibility doesn't have the same property at all. It would not be in the least bit divine to be inaudible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is something is very different about not being available to sight. And, may, and is that something to do with the way our consciousness works? Uh, th that's a great question, and I, I've, I've never encountered it before, so I'm just going to talk totally from the seat <laughs> of my pants. You know, my, 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 my gut feeling is that because we take in our most detailed understanding of the world around us through sight as opposed to through hearing, uh, we, we ascribe sort of a, a greater mystery to the things that are unavailable to mm. our sight. You know, so I think in, in the earliest days, as our distant brethren were impressed and overwhelmed with the forces of nature, they naturally would ascribe to it some kind of anthropomorphic cause, right? Because, you know, evolutionarily, what has our species done? We have survived because, and there are many reasons, but one of them is, is certainly the fact that We've gotten very good at reading our fellow compatriot out there on the savanna, right? We can figure out quickly whether there's danger. We can figure out relatively quickly whether there's going to be some cooperation. And that's a vital thing to survival. So what we tend to do, I think, is look out in the world and ascribe consciousness, 
perhaps unconsciously, but we ascribe consciousness to everything because it's been such a vital part of our survival that we've been able to read other minds in some broad brush sense. So I think it's quite natural that from that perspective, it's the unseen that is the where we invest the power. Right, because there's so many things that we see happening and we can't explain, so we envision that there's some conscious force behind it that's invisible to us, and that's the way that we can cope with this mystery. And I, I, I think in the audible realm, we just don't acquire enough information to invest it with the same kind of power. Mm. I mean, there's a tremendous emphasis in the way um, the investigations and experiments are reported on visuality. But does sound come into it at all or not? In the sense of? Uh, when, when it's CERN and when they're yes. looking for things. Does sound, does sound provide data? Uh, almost everything that we do in these realms is, is driven by visual representations yes. of mm -hmm. what's going on. But it's very interesting that you should say that, and we did not set this up, because only very recently in the last year have we shifted to some extent into an audible description of certain data, certain vital data. So I think many people may be familiar with that about a year ago, we had this first detection of gravitational waves. And gravitational waves naturally follow on Einstein's idea of the warped fabric of space, because if space can kind of warp like a trampoline, that suggests that if you sort of bounce, if you tap space, if you jump on the trampoline, you'll send ripples going along its surface. These are so-called gravitational waves. And the question is, Einstein's theory predicted that these things should exist, but could you find them? And if I'm not mistaken, if you bring the lights down, I think it may be that the next, yes, right, good. So here are, are two neutron stars that are sending out waves. They're not waves of sound, they're waves of gravity, but they're analogous. So how would you ever detect these? How would you hear these ripples in the fabric of space? And the math shows that if you're downstream from these ripples in the fabric of space, you will respond. Mm -hmm. You will respond by stretching and squeezing. That's what these waves do to you. Sound waves make your eardrum go back and forth. Yes. These gravitational waves make objects compress and stretch. Now the thing is, this would suggest it's very easy to detect these waves of gravity, but this image is not to scale. <laughs> and when you actually do the calculation, you find that the Earth would stretch or squeeze by less than a fraction of an atomic diameter. Mm. So the question is, how then would you ever detect these? And it took 40 years and, and billions of dollars to figure it out. But indeed, in September of 2015, this is what happened. Those are two ripples in the fabric of space. And that's what it would sound like if you turn those waves of gravity into waves of sound. Yes. So here we are hearing. Yes. And what are we hearing? Based on that, 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 that squiggle you see on the right hand side, we can tell a story of what gave rise to this ripple in the fabric of space. And the answer is two black holes, 1.3 billion light years away, were orbiting 1.3 billion years ago. They orbited really fast. They smashed into each other. They created a tidal wave, ripple in the fabric of space, that had incredible energy there. But then it traveled outward for enormous periods of time over enormous distances, and its strength diluted until finally it rolled by planet Earth 1.3 billion years later. And remarkably, two days before it hit Earth, we turned on these two detectors in Louisiana, <laughs> Washington State, and we twitched in just the right way that allowed us to figure out what was going on. Yes. So here's an example, bring the lights back up. Here's an example where we are envisioning and thinking yes. about the data in audio terms as opposed yes. to visual terms. It's also an extraordinary example of temporal luck. Yes. If it really was two days before. That's right, but you might say, how lucky were we? And some people suggest that the luck is reflective of the fact that these waves in the fabric of space are quite common. Oh. And, and that may really be what the answer is. So it may be that there's so many oh. black holes out there in space, and they're constantly orbiting and colliding with one another. So the thought is that when we get better detectors, we might be detecting these kind of collisions frequently, every day. 
And that would be sort of an amazing thing. You know, this room, the other thing that I could say about this room, going back to the first question, this room is filled with electromagnetic radiation, you know, radio waves, right? You know, I, uh, yeah. you know, you know I, I even see people right now detecting some of those waves on their, <laughs> on their devices. Uh, yes, and don't even know that I'm looking at them detecting the waves. You know, that, that's, that's how our, our brains go. <laughs> um, and, and, and so it may also be the case that this room is similarly filled with waves of gravity. And that's kind of an amazing thing, that the universe may be permeated mm. by these ripples in the fabric of space-time. Well, your fable, the Alan Al film, Icarus at the Edge of Time, that, that he, he'd write, do you want to describe what he, what he yeah, does? Yeah, that's a, that's a story that, that I wrote some years ago, uh, a rewriting, as the title suggests, of the familiar mm. myth of Icarus, which I, I was always troubled by, because it seemed to suggest that if a a courageous young boy doesn't do what his dad tells him he dies, and that always struck me as the ultimate fable of social control. And, and, <laughs> and, so it's, and as I became a scientist, it also became so antithetical to what we need to do to push the boundary yes. of understanding. We can't do what our metaphorical parents mm -hmm. in the scientific world tell us to do, or we'll never create anything new. So this, this rewriting of the story involves a boy that, against his father's wishes, flies a ship of his own making to the edge of a black hole. And he doesn't die for this transgression of authority, but he does have to deal with a very curious shift in reality, because the real science is, if you go near the edge of a black hole, time for you will slow down. So when you come back, it'll be far into the future. And for him, it's 10,000 years into the future. You may know of this, this storyline also happens in the film Interstellar, if you've seen that, mm. um, which came out after uh, our version of it. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Uh, but but it's, the same, it's the same basic idea. So, so I wrote this story, and uh, it came out as like a little, little tiny book. And uh, with Alan Al, we created a film for it. And with Philip Glass, we wrote an original orchestral score. So now it's a piece that's performed, yes, yes. sort of like Peter and the Wolf style. You know, as a film orchestra and narrator that kind of takes an audience on a journey, you know, into space to the edge of a black hole. And through that journey, you kind of get a feel for how black holes in the universe work without there being any pedagogical, you know, discussion. It's just sort of you go for a ride and you figure out what's happening. And you're like, whoa, you sort of take in the ideas. I think it's very interesting that you took a myth. And one of the people, the speakers today, um, actually said that the early uh, examples of attempts to understand these scientific mysteries um, were, were often uh, embedded in myth, so that in fact Icarus is, a, I suppose, a, a myth about the attempt to fly, but there are others about the, que the deep questions about death and time and, and the, the earth, composition of the earth itself, are often in... in, in yeah, in, but I have a question for, for you on that, uh, along that same theme, if you don't mind talking no, no, about no. that, because I know that's... Um, you know, I, I'm the layman here, and I like to switch the role a little bit. It always struck me on, on reading these myths and reading you know, the early accounts of the rise of religion that these stories were not meant to be taken as a literal attempt to really explain what was happening out there. Well, they were more a metaphorical way of coming to terms with the powerful forces that were out there that had tremendous impact on, on how lives were lived, but were not meant to be viewed as an explanatory framework. That was not really yeah, where well, they were coming from. You're going from. into very deep waters, because I think, I think I mean, one of the things that happened, I think, in the course of religious, and it may be re relevant to scientific writing as well, and that is that language is very metaphorically based. It really cannot actually do literal very well. Um, and so, you know, you're using molasses. You yes. don't really mean it's molasses. Right. But it's very hard for us to understand what you mean by the thickness and the viscosity of this, yes. of this fabric if you don't actually go for something material that we taste and understand. And that really is exactly what you just said. It wasn't meant to be taken literally. But because there is a tradition of ascribing these texts to God, that's not just true of Christianity, it's true, or, or Islam, it's true of 
at a certain point in modernity, it becomes much more of an argument yeah. after the Reformation. Yes. But it cannot be gainsaid because it's not metaphorical, it is what God said. Right. And, and so, for example, uh, Margaret Atwood's brilliant novel, The Handmaid's Tale, which has just been made into a film, is about a, di a dystopic vision of the future of society in which literal understanding of the Bible has created a kind of social uh, disaster. But that's and, kind of my, my so, yeah. point, mm. that it's been that transformation. Yes, it's from, the loss of metaphor. Yes, exactly. Yes. yes. But at the same time, uh, the, the uses of metaphor are, are, have been addressing something I want to ask you about, and, and that is the, the, the field of knowledge. I mean, the field, the electromagnetic field is a metaphor, um, but it is also another metaphor, which is it's a field of knowledge. And, and one of the um, sort of important aspects of society was always the who knows, who is allowed to know, who yeah. knows what, and how is that knowledge used. That was always understood, and so we have sages and maguses and so forth in the past. And I, I thought one of the contexts we could look at the work that you do and you know, people in your profession do and the whole question of visibility is the tradition of the magus, the person who knows. And I mean, I have a slide. I don't know where we are with the slides. Yeah, I think I may have one more, but you can skip yes, through no, it. No, no, go, go, go ahead, go well, ahead. Go ahead. Let's see yours. It, it, it's out no. of context. I would just blow through it and go right to yours. Really? Are you sure? I'm positive. Okay. Okay, so this is <laughs> so this is just because I thought that uh, the, the you know the, the kind of string theorist, mathematician, uh, physicist uh, in our time is a kind of magus, and and Solomon, the great figure belonging yeah. to the three Abrahamic religions, it, this is interestingly uh, a Jewish a Hebrew um, uh, manuscript, but it's in three languages in Arabic and Greek as well, and um, and so here you see Sa Solomon. Um, on his throne, and he's the master of the invisible forces. That'll come back again later. These invisible forces being um, actually represented as animal hybrids, demonic figures, the Queen of Sheba up there somewhere, and, and slightly humorous, I think. Um, but I mean, I know that you're probably too modest to say that you feel that you feel yourself in this. But can you? What is? What, how do you feel about the the sort of p the past figures of wisdom, the control of wisdom, the, well, the deepening of wisdom? Yeah, I mean, I I, I I've always uh, recoiled at the <laughs> idea that we are sort of the priestly caste that have somehow seen more deeply and have some special way into the deep knowledge of the world. And it's part of why I don't just do research. It's part of why I do go out and, and, and write books and try to bring these ideas to the general audience because, you know, much as then as well, it's just a language barrier. That's really all that it is. I mean, the ideas are those which are, are accessible to just about everybody so long as the language used doesn't segue into the technical jargon that mm. requires years of study to understand. Mm. So, so, you know, to my mind, it's the point is to move away from this kind of picture yes. where we all yes. have access yes. to these ideas. So I'm probably going to show you more things you want to move away from. <laughs> but um, well, I mean, one of the, th one of the uh, difficulties about the magician or magus figure was, of course, it was always a heterodox figure. I mean, it could go both ways. Right. King Solomon is fine. There were times he had lapses, but um, you know there are others who've been burned at the stake, and God knows what's happened to them for for having too much knowledge. Fortunately, that's a sign today that you know we're doing better because actually that's not so much. By today, okay. you mean like yesterday? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, let's yes. Anyway, so one of the way, one of the one of the. Um, the idea of looking into the invisible yeah. and trying to understand what the invisible might be and gain this knowledge was actually often to do with controlling forces that might hurt you. And I don't know if that can be um, something you identify with at all, that the knowledge that, you will be, that we will be gaining through. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, cause it, it, again, I think it's a, it's a question of the degree of uh, uh, literal versus metaphorical. You know, I, I do feel that a big part of what motivates not just us in science, but us as a, as a species, is the ultimate fear 
of, mm. of, of the biggest hurt, if you will, which is the denial of death, the fear of mm. death. Mm. You know, so as we try to deeply understand the universe at some level, the, the goal is to touch eternal truths. I mean, we have this image, we have this dream. Not every physicist believes this, and I'm sort of on the fence, but there's a thought that there's a chance that we could reach in to the depths of nature and pull out a fundamental f mathematical fact that describes how the universe actually works. And it's immutable, it's unchangeable. It is this eternal truth. And what a wonderful thing for a finite being that's gonna only live on this earth for a tiny fraction of the length of time that the universe will exist, to have the capacity maybe to touch something timeless. Mm. So from that perspective, I would agree with that description. Mm. I mean, it, it leads to a lot of kind of aberrant uh, uses of magic. I mean, I, I've got this, this is, yeah. a, this is a very beautiful book of the, um, sorry, of the, um, from, the uh, from the Ottoman Empire. Um, Call, call the Book of Happiness, the Book of Felicity, and it's all filled with magical formulae for keeping unhappiness, causes of unhappiness at bay, including harms to children. So this is the, the, the talisman of the nightmare, the prayer that you say to prevent your little girl. The, the book was made for, for his the, daughter, right? For his daughter, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. It's made for his daughter. There That's she right. is. Yeah. And the nightmare is there being conjured, but the picture is made to keep it away. And of course, this is all intimations of invisible forces. Yeah. These are not things that you can see or, 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 or um, so just finally, Solomon again. Um, and here he is, because he, this is why it connects to physics. And this is the last uh, picture of this sword, but it connects to physics because he was credited with power over the elements. Right. So he was credited in the Quran, in fact, with power over wi the winds, the waters and so forth. They're all personified as forces. Yeah. So this sort of yeah, yeah, so I wouldn't want to move away from this at all, interpreted <laughs> in the way that I was indicating before, yeah. mm -hmm. because I, I think part of what drives us is the, the knowledge, the insight that we can gain about the force of gravity, about the electromagnetic force, you know, about the nuclear forces. These, the power that comes from that insight, mm -hmm. it does allow us to elevate our sense of security in the universe. The universe is no longer this opaque mystery where things can hit us from this side and that side and we have no understanding how it works or where it's coming from. All of a sudden, we gain this capacity to control, to manipulate the universe. I mean, think about what we can do today, right? In, in, that, in that laptop of yours, we are manipulating the motion of electrons through these tiny microscopic circuits to be able to create all this <laughs> stuff around us. What power is that? Yes. You know, there's this wonderful interview sort of at the other end of the spectrum with Freeman Dyson. And Freeman Dyson was being interviewed after the Manhattan Project. It was a retrospective look at what they had accomplished. And he was speaking from the heart about the ultimate thrill, and of course there's a horribly tragic and negative side to this, of course, but he was talking about this ultimate thrill of this group of individuals who came together and by virtue of putting together equations and experiments and observation, they were able to build a device that could harness the atom and split it apart to create this enormous explosion. What power? He was saying this felt like the power of the gods. Mm. So, so yes, this mm. is what we do now is an extension, I think, of exactly that idea. Yeah. But I think that it's, it, it's still worrying, isn't it? That yeah. We, I, mean, I mean, what you said, of course, about the Manhattan Project is also uh, worrying for a different reason. But, the, but the, um, it's simply this, this notion that the impulse to know going back in time keeps coming up with these phantoms. You mean, mean things that yeah. are, are, are more a product of the imagination yes, than yes. a, yes. You know, I think that's the mm. substantial break that happens with, with Newton and forward. Yes. All of a sudden, we start to constrain the imagination mm. through the straitjacket of reality. Mm. So now we start to channel these impulses, mm. at least through some individuals, into investigations that reveal what we think are truths about the world as opposed to fantasies about yeah, the world. Yeah. And that's a vital moment. Mm. 
Yes, the, uh, the, I mean the, I, the history of optics, because I think that one of the um, uh, one of the puzzles of invisibility is that it keeps receding. I mean, things become visible. Yeah. And the history of optics and of optical instruments um, keeps turning what were totally invisible things to people in the past into visible things. And actually, this this image, which is uh, Kirscher's. Uh, the, the first magic lantern machine made. It's actually quite interesting that I couldn't find a version of it online that didn't have Getty on it. Right. But actually, I think that was there. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, in the original. <laughs> but also, it's exactly the point you made yeah. about the laptops and the, right. you know, right. because now the, 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 this, this image is only coming to us. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, so. But yeah, I mean, I, I'd say that science, physics, specifically, but science more generally, it has been the journey of making the invisible visible. That's really what it is. And you know, this is a, a wonderful illustration of um, uh, a way in which a very simple device, mm -hmm. I mean, the pinhole camera is this amazing device mm -hmm. where you can create an image. You can create a replica of what's happening out there in the world by mm -hmm. virtue of uh, a simple process of, of mm. gathering the light and processing it in the correct way. I mean, obviously, you know, the curious thing is the image that's formed yes. here. It suggests that there's more to the world than you would think mm. based upon observation. Mm. You know, I don't know what, what that exactly is on the right hand side, but it seems well, if something you, from the if underworld. You'd had, if you'd had my childhood, you would know. Yes, what is it? it it's a soul burning in hell. Soul burning in hell, <laughs> there you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. My childhood too, definitely though. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, so be careful when you look deeply. <laughs> oh, I didn't. Anyway, they, but there was a struggle, wasn't there? There was a tremendous struggle in the sort of period, I mean, of the 17th century. People were worried about the collision between what they had been told they should believe and what they were finding out with the development of new science and yeah. with Newton's questions and, you know, and so forth. So, um, But I don't even mean it facetiously. I mean, yeah. that is a struggle that's still happening, mm. right? This is not a struggle that we have left behind. You know, at least, you know, there are a significant number of people, significant fraction of the population that is still struggling with exactly that same issue. Oh, well, it's the, yeah, that's on the rise, that. I mean, but not in the scientific community. Not in the scientific it's community so per se, yes. right. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I was very, very struck that, um, you know, that Robert Boyle, the great scientist, um, he had a terrible, terrible difficulty with how to reconcile the spirits that were attested in the Bible yeah. with what he found in the world, I mean, what he found in his laboratory. Yeah, not and the only one. I mean, Newton yeah. at some level too, right? I mean, you know, Newton obviously did some spectacular, as did Boyle, right? There's Boyle's law, which actually wasn't his law, it turns out, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, you know, he did wonderful work on, on the properties of gases. And Newton obviously did important work on so many things. But you look at Newton's collected uh, preoccupations and substantial fraction of what he was thinking about was utter nonsense. The kind of stuff that if you receive it today in a letter, you say, oh, nutcase, and you sort of put it in the garbage. Mm -hmm. He was spending his time on nutty crap. Mm -hmm. You know, because, you know, we had yet to evolve to the point where certain collections of ideas didn't have the same hold on us as they, as they once did. It was, was it mostly alchemy? Alchemy was only part of it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, he had a whole focus on a religious side of things mm -hmm. that really was mm -hmm. hard to imagine reconciling with the same mind mm -hmm. that had figured out the fundamental laws of classical mechanics, mm. the fundamental law of gravity. Mm. You know, the same mind that had worked out the calculus. This requires incredible creativity and incredible um, uh, fortitude to stick with the ideas and the facts and the and the rational thinking and logical progression. And then there's this whole other side that just doesn't have any bearing, any relationship mm. to that kind of thought process. But yet it was there. Mm. 
Yes, I don't. I mean, I don't know what Newton. I know that Boyle, because I. I mean, I'm sure it's probably yeah. analogous. Yes. You know. Well, this this Michael Hunter's um, ed, 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 edition of uh, a book that Boyle commissioned. Bush, Boyle said, since the Bible has spirits in it, we cannot deny the existence of spirits. And people like Hobbes were saying, no, we, this is just nonsense. This is just uh, superstition, idle fantasy, yep. and the ignorance of the people. With our scientific knowledge, we will banish all that ignorance. Um, and Boyle said, no, we can't, because the Bible says spirits exist, so we have to find them. Right. So he sent out, he paid for somebody to go and do field work amongst the beliefs of, and, and produce this extraordinary book, which right. is the first um, sort of compendium of stories about fairies abducting, you know, alien abduction in its early form. So, <laughs> but the two, it seems to me such an extraordinary contrast. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and the fact that there are multiple examples of the same kind of thing really suggests the tumult Mm. which moving into the era mm. of modern science created. Mm. And, 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 you know, I, I don't know the, the yes. chronology, and maybe this chronology is way off, but it strikes me that the power, the newfound power of science to actually describe the world is, is, is being conflated by these kinds of individuals to reinterpret certain mythological or mm. sacred texts to try to see them in the same light to try to see them yes. as telling us real things about the world as opposed to a metaphorical description yes. of how we try to cope with this strange environment that we find ourselves thrust within. So I, 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 it strikes me that part of that transition has as its legacy this kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And the other great area of the unseen and the unseeable um, that was investigated very intensely was of course the world of the dead. Mm. Um, and the whole idea of the ghost and how people lived in the invisible realm. So, um, and it's to me kind of interesting that there was a terrific struggle to, to um, represent ghosts. Uh, this book actually, a very good book. It, it comes, it, comes it's, it was published first in French and it's certainly in English as well. Uh, ghosts in the Middle Ages, and, and, and they, they're usually white and colorless ghosts in the tradition, as if that the sort of conditions of darkness would produce these, like, like growing celery and keeping it white. Right, right. <laughs> the, ghosts, the ghosts are... are um... But do, do you feel sometimes you're, when you're looking at the edge of time or you're looking into these, looking at these mysteries of black Are you going to ask me if I see, if I see ghosts? Is yeah, that where yes, we're going Yes, here? I am, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, um, I, I don't. Uh, but, um, but, but, you know, I, I, I would say that, again, one of the great mysteries of, of not just science, but one of the great mysteries of, of the world at large is how is it the case, how is it the case that a collection of particles that are just operating under the blind laws of physics, slamming into each other, bouncing up, that's all that particles do. Somehow collections of them can come together and become animated as living beings. What an amazing miracle that is. What an amazing mystery it is. And we do not know the answer for how it can be the case that this very same laws that govern the electrons inside your laptop, governing the electrons inside your body, somehow create that versus that. Yes. That's very, so you can well imagine that when that ceases to be that, there's a sense that something must have left. Mm. Something must have gone someplace else. So the, 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 the thought process that leads to a picture like that, I have complete sympathy with. And I don't, I mean, I don't think that's the right way of thinking no. about it, but I don't know what the right way is, and I don't think anybody does. But you've been, uh, you've written an, a lot about how time, we could, as, as Icarus does in your story, m move forward in time and come back that way, but we can't go back from this point. Yes, yes, well even, you know, when it comes to time itself, we certainly know how to time travel to the future. Yes. And it's not nonsense, not science fiction, it's not controversial. There are ways to do it. I described one before, go near a black hole. The other way is you go travel near the speed of light, a round trip journey, you come back, it will be the future. Yes. 
with the number of years in the future just dependent on how fast and how far you went. Uh, but even in those straightforward situations, the idea of going back, even from those future moments, we don't no, know no. how to do that. And I would think if you were to take a survey, although I've never done it, most physicists who know what they're talking about would probably say, I, I don't think we're ever going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I think when we understand physics better, we'll probably rule out the possibility of traveling the other direction. So it's a curious thing, the nature of time, yes. right? I mean. Time is so vital to everything that we do, everything we experience, right? It's what gives life meaning, right? Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I have no idea what time is. We know some properties of time that contradict or, or certainly are uh, counterintuitive is a better word, that time elapses at different rates for different individuals, experience different gravity, different motion, and yeah, why does time have a direction to it? Why can you go this way and not that way? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a, a vital question that we still struggle with. There are ideas, but that is rare. All of, of human anxiety, all of human achievement, all of human aspiration, it's all tied to this one directional notion to time. And why is it like that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, well, Hamlet is the great example of um, a ghost coming back. and. Um, and, but the interesting thing about Hamlet is that the opening scene, everybody sees the ghost. Right. Or, the, or the, his friends have seen the ghost, and then he sees the ghost of his father. Yep. But later, he sees the ghost only, only he sees the ghost. And I think that's a kind of property of invisibility that we haven't sort of talked about very much, and that is that it fluctuates between, you know, that, that there are occasions where hallucination happens and many there's a, a famous case of someone seeing a phenomenon in the sky you know some portent in the sky and the person nudges him and says no the whole crowd is worshiping this portent and the person elbows him and says no no it's just you know a trick of the light and suddenly it's it changes and it becomes a trick of the light i see i see yeah, yeah. i mean it, so that yeah i mean well the funny thing of course about about the scientific parallel to the, to the human experience of the invisible that we're talking about here is the beauty of the scientific version is we like to think that exactly what happens there is not what happens with us. We like to think that laws that are figured out are ubiquitous. They apply everywhere and possibly every when. And we like to think that regardless of where you are in the universe, the, the things that science has illuminated are the things that will be illuminated everywhere. Now, is that the case? You know, it's, it's hard to, I mean, it could be that, you know, in the far future, we make contact with some alien civilization way out on the other side of the universe. And what they have figured out and their picture of reality is completely different from ours, that they are illuminating and revealing things that their version of reality had initially had as invisible, and now their work is made visible, and it may have no relationship mm -hmm. to our picture of reality. It could be a different slice through reality. It could even be the case that the language, we were talking about language and metaphor before, so we use mathematics. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that we talk to the aliens and they say, so show us the approach that you've taken, and we bring out our beautiful textbooks you know, with all our equations, and they kind of go, math, yeah, okay, right, we know, we tried that, you know. <laughs> you know it just takes you so far, mm -hmm. right? The real way, when you become a mature intellectual civilization, is to jettison all that math stuff and to do it this way. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what this way could be. I don't even, I can't even imagine what this way would be, which isn't isomorphic to mathematics, just in a different language. After all, mathematics ultimately is the language of of patterns, mm. right, and encapsulating them in a manner that allows you to uniformize your description of patterns. But maybe there's a whole different language out there that I don't have the creative capacity to envision, and using that language, you'd reveal a whole different universe, a whole mm. different reality. But what, you have been, what you've been doing just there is actually kind of doing literature, doing science fiction. I mean, that's what 
a lot of science fiction tries to do is imagine what might be That's right. the alternative universe, the alternative, and ask questions. Right, right. and every so often mm -hmm. it actually tells us something about the yeah. real world. Yes, absolutely, you know. yes. So I think we could take questions. Sure, here, yeah, 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 happy to. I think there are, um, there are microphones on either side of the hall, and um, the idea is if you could come up and, um, yes, go ahead. Uh, Brian Green, uh, at a little earlier point, was talking about the fact that as science develops and as people get the expected results, that might cause less funding. I'm wondering with the current administration where as you get the same results, they immediately become hoaxes, do you think that might help <laughs> to move towards new and different metaphorical languages for science? You know, you're very, you're very optimistic, you know, framing it with that particular spin. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is we're uh, in, an, in an unfortunate era, and I think many of you know there's a, a March for Science happening on, on Saturday. Yes. You know, we're in an unfortunate era where the, the value of the basis of rational thinking is, is being degraded, right? There's a, and again, I'm not really, I was joking before, but forget about Republican, it, does, it doesn't matter, it's not a partisan issue. The fact of the matter is there are facts about reality, and it's certainly the art of governance is figuring out what to do with those facts, how to respond to them, what policies to have. So I'm in no way saying, as some of my colleagues have, in a, in, a, in a very flat-footed and naive way, saying, you know, government should follow the principles of science. I think that's kind of silly because the art of governance is trying to use a limited amount of information and conflicting perspectives to try to figure out policy that ultimately does good. And that's a hard thing to do. I don't think it's a scientific process per se. But what is scientific is to agree on the basis of reality, on the facts that you're trying to respond to. And if you can't do that, you're sunk. And that's, that's really where the danger is right now. O'Brien, a few years ago at the Y, you said that uh -oh. string theory is not a theory, it's an hypothesis. Yes, yeah. Good. But everybody keeps talking about it as a theory. Yeah. Is it a theory or is it not? No, you know, that's a, that's a quirk of language, yeah. okay. which is really just, you know, historically contingent. In the early days, it was described as string theory, and that's, that's unfortunate because theory in science, as we all know, has a very different meaning from theory in common language. Common language theory is, you know, a hunch, a speculation, an idea, a possibility. Theory in science is a body of understanding that's been rigorously tested and can describe a whole swath of reality. That's what a theory is, scientifically. And string theory is not that. String theory has not been tested as yet. We hope it one day will be. String theory, we do not know that it describes anything to do with reality. So it really needs, properly speaking, to be called the string hypothesis, as thankfully I said. Well, you said it, yes. Yeah, at, at some earlier time. Can I ask yes. a second question? You what can. made the creators of the string hypothesis decide that the object that they're talking about was a string and not a cube or a rod or a, or a sphere? Well, that, that all comes from the mathematics because string, string theory right now is really just a body of mathematics. And within the body of mathematics that was initially motivated to describe data that was actually coming out of early collisions at, at CERN many, many years ago. But within the mathematics, one could see that the math described the data and was at the same time also describing a vibrating filament. You could see that plain in the equations. Mm -hmm. And that's where the first hint that this theory was talking about a theory of elementary string-like objects emerged. Okay. So, and you can see right there in the math. So that's where sort of the language barrier comes out. And, and maybe, you, maybe you do speak mathematics, but, but to those who don't, you can see right in the equations that that's what you're talking about. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, so, Brian, two questions again, since I guess that's the, the trend. Um, uh, first, do you think um, describing the universe is continuous? Is that, um, can you, do you think that's a good model for the universe? And uh, 
uh, what do you think would be a good replacement for it if that's not the case? And two, um, you talked about the sort of like other language that some alien civilization might give us. Do you think that might be something imperative like computer code or uh, programs? Yeah. So, um, so, so for the first one, whether the universe is continuous, you know, is, is this notion of if you could examine the fabric of space. We had some pictures of it in some of the animations. If you could examine the fabric of space on fantastically small scales, would you find that it involves a collection of points that are smoothly joined together in the manner of a, of a, of a, small, of a smooth entity, a, you know, a differentiable manifold in the language of mathematics? Or might you find it's more like a lattice, that there are a collection of distinct points with no conception of space between them, that the, the reality is just the points, not the stuff between the points. And, and we don't know the answer to this question today. So it's, it's totally up in the air. People pursue both possibilities, and, and no doubt that there are other possibilities too. I mean, there's, there's reason from string theory to think that it might not be continuous, that the fundamental description might be using the mathematics of matrices, which have a, have a, have a, a discrete quality in some sense to them. But we don't know the answer. And for the second question, which is also heading into the, the, the very speculative realm, what might that language be that the aliens are using? Well, you know, if you talk to somebody like Steve Wolfram, he's not an alien by any means, you know, a very smart guy, and, um, and, and he does think that reality is governed by some version of, of computer code, that there is some kind of uh, cell, cellular automatized some level that's evolving the universe forward in a, in a very discreet manner, a characteristic of, of, of computer-like evolution. Uh, and and he's, he's convinced that that's the right language for describing the universe. So, so yes, that's a possibility, but there's no evidence for that, at least in my view today. Yeah, thanks. And he doesn't speak about it as well as you speak, so well. that's part of the reason. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks for being here. And um, I have a question. You almost got to collective consciousness. You're right on the edge, I thought. Yeah. Uh, maybe you could tell us uh, how you see the relationship between collective consciousness and quantum mechanics. Well, uh, that's a very easy question, of course, to just, uh, <laughs> you, you know, um, um, look. Um, I got two, two answers. I mean, one answer is there are some who think that quantum mechanics already, our understanding of quantum mechanics already gives us insight into the nature of consciousness. I'm not one of those people. Um, there, there, are, there are colleagues of mine, and you probably know who I'm referring to, who believe that they've answered the issue of free will, the conundrum of free will, by appealing to quantum mechanics. Now, the conundrum of free will in terms of our basic understanding of physics is if you've got deterministic laws, right, where in those laws you specify how things are and those laws tell you how things are later on, well, those laws should also apply to the particles that make us up. And therefore, if you can't predict how these particles will evolve over time, you should be able to predict everything that takes place inside a human being, at least in principle, and then where is there any room for that autonomous individual to make a volitional choice, right? There's nowhere in the laws of physics where it says, oh, and fill in the piece over here where Joe decided what to do. There's nothing like that in the laws of physics. So that's where the conundrum is. Now, some people say quantum mechanics. That solves the problem. Because in quantum mechanics, you can only predict the probability of one or another outcome and because it's only a probabilistic prediction that's being made, therein lies the power of the individual to make a choice. And that's utter nonsense at our current level of understanding because there's no place again that the human makes any choice. There's a vast difference between a random outcome governed by a probabilistic measure that comes from quantum mechanics and choice. I don't think we'd ever say that free will is, oh yeah, someone's flipping a coin and that's what's determining what's going on. That does not feel like the conventional notion of free will or the conventional notion of conscious will. Now, I have to also say that there are features of quantum mechanics we don't understand. There's the quantum measurement problem. 
that we don't understand. And it could be, to finally come to your question, that maybe somewhere in our deeper understanding of quantum physics that will happen in the future, we'll find that the solution to this measurement problem, how do you go from the probabilistic description of the math to the definite reality of experience, maybe somewhere in there there's a link to consciousness. Maybe somewhere in there there's a link to some new force field called the consciousness field. And maybe somehow we're tapping into that in some strange way, like my friend Matthew Ricard, you know, Buddhist uh, monk who strongly feels, as I think many from that persuasion do, that the real reality is the consciousness field that's out there. And all we are doing is sort of we're vessels that tap into it. I don't know. I mean, I can't say that that's wrong. I can't say there's a stitch of evidence for it whatsoever. But yes, there's a potential link there. But we're far from it. And folks who say that right now we can make the link between quantum mechanics and consciousness, I don't, I don't know what they're talking about. Thanks. Brian, there are a lot of people. So I think, could you take a bunch of questions? Yeah, sure. I think and I'll the, answer them you know, rather simultaneously. Than, rather than one or two. Yeah. So I think we'll take, we'll take a, the two questions first, and then we'll have to take possibly more. So let's take two questions first. Okay, my question's low in word count, so maybe that makes it easier. Yes. Um, we've talked it, a lot. 140 characters, can you do it? No, I don't use Twitter. All but, right. Um, All right. I, we've talked a lot about invisibility, that is, not seeing and then seeing. And I, I was wondering if you could offer some comments on the difference between seeing and understanding. Yeah. Because I think it, whether it's in the realm of physics or other realms, I think sometimes we conflate seeing things happen and understanding how or better yet, even why they happen. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a, a great question. Oh, I'm sorry, you didn't yeah, want yeah. me to answer it yet? No, I think you'll take two together because it's going to I wonder how that saves time, but anyway, let, let's try it. Yeah. Because yeah. there could let's be overlaps. That. Let's go. Or maybe they like conflate in something. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I feel like I'm at a disadvantage. Uh, <laughs> So we're, we're always thinking of reaching the eternal truth through mathematics, through logical reasoning. Yeah. But how do you think intuition plays a role in that? Could that possibly be? Good. Yeah. Those questions really do work together. You are <laughs> brilliant. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, so, so you know, you, you're describing what's the difference between seeing something and understanding something. And that really is, at least to my mind, what, what physics is all about. I mean, the goal is to look out in the world, be able to recognize that certain things happen, and then pull back the curtain and understand the story that's behind it all, making it happen, and through that story, gaining an actual intuition for how reality is constructed. And it's not as though the way I described it is the chronology in which all of this unfolds. It's actually a blending of it. I mean, the work of a physicist is to look out in the world understand some of what's happening, being able to explain part of what you see, building up an intuition, looking at this part of the world, using that intuition to gain a deeper insight and to suggest a pathway toward deeper truth, go back to the things that you can see through data, pull back the curtain a little bit further, and it's this wonderful back and forth between mathematics, intuition, observation, which is seeing, and ultimate deeper understanding. Now, you seem to be unsatisfied with that answer, but let's... Uh... But do you think... No, I think, no, I'm sorry. There's really so many people that we have to c keep going. But maybe a quick, just like, just... I mean, what it's very say? quick. quick. Yeah. Um, do you think that maybe philosophy leads to the physics? Sometimes the creative thought and maybe thinking outside of the box is really what leads to these hypotheses that physicists can develop Yes, on. yes, I, I do, although many of my colleagues dismiss philosophy. As, as nothing that has nothing to do with what we physicists do. I, I think that's a wrong way of thinking about things. I think being able to look out in the world, kick the tires the way that philosophers do, and really frame the questions in a way that might be unfamiliar is a vital part of the mission, and it's important to progress. So yes, I think, in short, the answer is yes. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Um, you talked about gravity and you talked about ghosts. And suddenly, uh, yesterday in British news, science news, there was um, uh, uh, several articles about um, that scientists uh, dis uh, created f a fluid with negative mass. Yeah. They, they described it like if you push it, it comes to you. And, but probably ghosts uh, could be described as something from negative mass. And how actually you can see negative mass? It's also the question. 
Is it visible? How it could be visible? Yeah, unfortunately, I saw the headline, but I did not read the article. So, uh, for fear of uh, being a, a, a box of hot air, I'm going to not answer your question. <laughs> and I think that's a good model. If you don't know something, God damn it, say it. All right, go ahead. All right, so I'd like to go um, to the jettisoning of mathematics uh, thing from the aliens. So, like, it seems to me at least that our modern system of mathematics is not like, you know, pure essence. It, Arabic numbering system was invented somewhere. Elsewhere, they used other ways to number yeah. things. Um, and it's base 10, whereas there are many other possible sure. variations. The Mayans did a lot with 5 and 20 bases. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if there's been, and maybe this is for both of you, any thought about how other types of mathematics, could, other than base 10 and Arabic numbering systems, could be used to push farther in that envelope? Uh, do you have thoughts on that? Or, or, uh I, I, no, I'm getting more anxious about the time because we're meant to end at eight. Oh, so then, yeah, so, so there, there's another numerical system. You know, again, this is base, uh, base 12. Uh, but, um, but very quickly, uh, you know, what I would say is the issues that you're specifically raising, like base 10 or Arabic, those are, those are not the real deep issues because anything that's done in base X, you can do in base Y. It's just, there's a translation. It's a wonderful dictionary. Anything that's done with Arabic, any other numerical system, it'd be isomorphic to it. You can set up a nice, beautiful dictionary between them. The way you say things may be different, but in the end of the day, the, the true statements will be true in both. The real issue, I think, is whether there's a, a radically different system where you know, you know, the axioms are so radically different from the axioms that underlie the traditional mathematical systems that you're off in a completely different logic, a completely different structure. And whether that has relevance to the world, we, we don't know. We've done really well with the system of mathematics that we do use, but could it be that it's just plain not the right one to align with reality? That's the question, and I, I don't think anybody has an answer to that. But, but since it all was cooked up in the human brain, it's certainly possible that it isn't deeply tied into reality. Instead, it's deeply tied into our perception of reality. And those could be two very different things. Thank you. I have two very quick questions. One, is it fair to say that you don't embrace the holographic theory of existence? Uh, if you're talking about the real holographic theory, that would not be a correct statement. If you're talking about the kind of mm, flimsy one that I see spoken about in certain earlier books, then it would be a correct statement. Okay, well, I don't know if we have time to distinguish. Yeah, the maybe two, not. Yeah. But I have an, uh, the second question is pretty quick, too. You said before that, that it hasn't been proven that you could go back in time. But if reality as we know it is a creation of our thoughts, yeah. a thought form, Every time we think about any past event, as I'm sure anyone has in this room, yeah. isn't it true that we're transported back in time to a no. certain extent? No, we're not. Why, you're, you're, why is that? Well, you know, I, I, I believe that you are having a, a mental configuration that's deeply influenced by past events. But if I just look inside your head and look at the particles that are responsible and the fields responsible for your experience, those configurations are happening now. They're not happening in the past. So they can be influenced by the past, but by recreating a mental pattern, you aren't recreating the past. You're recreating, obviously, what we call a memory of the past. And those are two distinct things. But do you think time is really that fixed, that you can make that, that distinction? Well, that's a different question. You know, uh, So it's one thing, if we can just agree, that when you think about the past, you're not back in the past. Let's agree on that as like one of those facts that are true of reality. Uh, and then another interesting question is, does time have a greater flexibility that we're currently unaware of? And, 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 could and that's I'm possible. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. So I was wondering, you uh, spoke a, a little bit about pulling, pulling truth from, uh, from the universe. and. Um, in, in science and in physics in particular, there seems to be kind of like um, a, a desire to aestheticize um, our equations and aversion to fine tuning. And I guess I wondered what you thought about the limitations of, of that. Yeah, you know, um, you know, we do use, I mean, the title of my first book, The Elegant Universe, right? It, it has that 
aesthetic urge right there in, in the title. And, and you're right. Part of what we do, both in mathematics as a, as a pure subject and in physics as sort of the applied version of mathematics, is we do urge for explanations that have a kind of economy, a simplicity, a, a power of their reach from the paucity of their assumptions. That to us is, is quite beautiful. But it's also the case that as our understanding progresses, the new understanding reshapes our aesthetic, right? There are things that, you know, to Newton, I think it would take him a little bit of time to acclimate to the beauty of, of certain insights. So it's a two-way street. So in the end of the day, I would say that if it's true, we're going to find a way of viewing it as beautiful. So, so, it, so it's not just one direction. Thank you. All right, uh, I, have a question. I have two questions, basically. Um, I've read that uh, the discoveries that they made about the universe, it only like represent only one percent of the whole universe. Is that the reality? The second part of the question, uh, I ne for my lifetime yet, I never seen any building built itself. So there's always an, en an engineer behind it, an architect. Yeah. So, but when you consider the whole the universe itself, do you believe that there is an invisible uh, person behind it? Yeah, so, sure. So, so for the first question, you know, that we understand sort of one percent of the universe, I, I suspect you're talking about the fact that matter, which we spend a lot of time trying to figure out, constitutes maybe four percent of the mass of the universe, and most of the bulk of the universe is either in dark matter or dark energy, which collectively constitutes something like ninety-six percent of the reality that's out there. So, in that sense, we spend a lot of time explaining a small percent of things, so there are deep mysteries, and that, that certainly is reflected in the fact that we don't know what the dark matter is, we don't know what the dark energy is, and so on. As to your second question about, you know, whenever there's a building, there's been an engineer and a builder that's put it together, you, you know, I guess I have uh, sort of two ways of thinking about it. Um, one is, if you look at the entity that designed and built that building, and you sort of blur your eyes a little bit, that entity is just a collection of particles governed by the laws of physics. <laughs> so I know we want to ascribe more to that collection of particles than that, but honestly, it seems to me that that's all that it is. So when I blur out my eyes, it's still just the laws of physics channeled through particular collections of particles. You know, uh, now, if that, doesn't, if that doesn't satisfy you, I would go back to some other beautiful things that are constructed. So we don't just build buildings. There are also stars and galaxies and planets. And a star is a really intricate and robust structure. It's this incredible nuclear furnace where atoms are being combined together in a very specific way that's allowing the generation of heat. Let me look at, you know, and I don't think that there was any life form that created the stars. And yet, they have a beautiful structure, they have a beautiful order to them, and it's just the laws of physics. So there's an example where you can just sort of step outside of this context and you recognize, yeah, structure can emerge from the chaos. We always think second law of thermodynamics, there can't be any order because it all is driving toward disorder, it's total nonsense. Second law of thermodynamics says overall the order is going to degrade, but there are processes that allow order to be created at the expense of greater amount of disorder that's emitted to the environment. And that's all that happens when you build a building, and that's all that happens when you build a star. And ultimately, I think it's just the laws of physics. So I also have two quick questions. The first question is about uh, the simulation argument. Yeah. Uh, the, the very popular one about how we yep, yep. possibly are living in this like simulated world of, um, of images that are mm -hmm. not ultimately true. Um, my second question is about uh, Oh, is there a question there? You mean you want my view I mean, on like, that? Yeah, your view on that and how yeah, it's possible. physics could. It's possible. You okay. know, and it's a very compelling argument to imagine that if it's the case that we can create within a computer an artificial environment in which there are inhabitants that are so intricately constructed within that artificial environment that they have consciousness. Is that possible? I don't know. But if that is possible, and we've not ruled it out, and everything that we're heading towards seems to suggest it might be possible, then yeah, it'll be very, very easy to create simulated worlds 
in which there are sentient inhabitants. It's very hard to create a real universe. Go do it, right? You know, it's very hard to create. So in the far future, that would suggest that sentient beings, there are many, many more of them in these simulated worlds than in the real world, which means if you are rational and you ask yourself, what's the likelihood that I'm in that one real universe versus that gazillion other simulated worlds that are being created in computers all over the world, all over the universe, uh, it's, it's obviously much more likely that you're in a simulated world. <laughs> and that's the conclusion that, that we should draw right here too, you know, this, this chain of reasoning. Yeah. Uh, my second question concerns um, the, uh, the science education. So, the what? Uh, education of science. So I'm a big fan of your books and I grew up like um, studying physics that really helped me grow intellectually. So I'm wondering where do you think um, the education of science is going and where do you think it should go? So education, that's what we're talking about? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. specific education of the science. Yeah, well, well I, you know, I, I think we have, uh, uh, to put it, put it mildly, uh, uh, there's a great deal of room for growth in, in, uh, <laughs> in, 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 in the way we, we educate the young in these ideas. Um, and I think the real problem is we have been constrained for a very long time to a one-size-fits-all type of education because the number of teachers very small compared to the number of students. So how else are you going to do it? Teacher does the best they can. They explain it the best they can, and some kids are going to get it, some kids won't. The real change, the game changer, will be when we can get to real personalized education. And that can be through the digital space. It can be through the virtual reality space. I think there's incredible opportunity in the virtual reality space. You know, uh, just as a side note, I mean, one project that I'm involved with is trying to create some, some virtual reality lessons where some of the ideas that we spoke about here and some that we didn't like, you know, what does a higher dimensional space really look like, right? It's very hard to explain these things. Showing animation can help, but imagine you can go in and walk through a higher dimensional space. I mean, it's that, that to me is really where the game changer is. So I think as, as students begin to experience these abstract realms, they will gain the intuition that somebody asked about earlier because they'll experience it. And if you can experience these abstract realms, I think that changes your level of comprehension. And I'd say that's the big opportunity that's on the horizon. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all. <laughs>